We're now going to begin looking at general linear, general linear models and doing a brief review of them. Again, this is brief and this is assuming that you've taken some course where you've already covered them in some detail. This is more about just getting used to doing it in R. Uh, this is using, uh, the, the script we're going to follow along with is the GLM Review Part 1, 2012. Um, although anyone of a similar name probably are pretty similar to that that I've written. A um, couple of things before we start. Uh, it's worth your time getting used to using the formula um, class of objects and I would definitely look at uh, some of the examples if you just go question mark formula because there's a couple of ways of doing this when you have very large models how to generate them uh, quickly especially when they have generic names like X or what you know your, your covariates are all X's or something like that um, it's worth taking a look at and we will definitely do that a lot more when we're, when we're actually explicitly fitting these models in a likelihood framework in the Bayesian framework we're going to use two libraries today arm and car I've already loaded them up and for this first part, we're really only going to cover a few chunks. We're going to probably get into interpreting the model output. That'll cover us for about the first 15 minutes, but not much beyond that. I've already input the data, and uh, like we've done before, uh, for this data set, this is, again, this distillus uh, versus wild type different mutants looking at uh, sex comb teeth. And here we're going to be modeling sex comb teeth as a function of the length of the tarsus, which is the leg that the sex comb tooth structure is actually present on, uh, on in males. Um, we can start by looking at a summary of the data. And if you do so, uh, you will see that our summary, we've got our 11 different variables here. Um, most of them are numeric. Replicate uh, and genotype are being treated as uh, and temperature are all treated as factors. That's only because initially they were, when you input them they were treated numerically but I've already gone in and called them and coerced them into into factors because we want to treat replicate and in this case temperature also as factors, as, as discrete categories as opposed to a continuous variable. I've also re-leveled genotype and what that means is instead of the default level for genotype being uh, alphanumeric which in this case would be DLL, I wanted it to be uh, d the default level to be something that's easy for me to interpret, which is going to be the wild type level. So basically we're saying the reference level is wild type and we're comparing everything to wild type. In this case, there's only two levels, but it's the same idea. We could look at the structure of the data as well. I'll just do this here. Again, just taking a look at number of observations. There's 1918 observations. Um, 11 variables, and we can look at it. What, what's factor, replicate, line, genotype, and temperature? Okay, that makes sense. Again, if you import it, probably those will import. Uh, some of those will import as numeric. And you just have to change them. Uh, and then we've got femur, tibia, tarsus, and sex comb teeth. We also have log transform values of those, but don't worry about that. You could you can ignore those for now. Um, and just for purposes here, again, we've had some discussion about missing data previously. I'm just going to remove. Uh, any missing uh, data. So any rows that have any missing data at all are going to be excluded from the analysis we're doing that. Clearly isn't a sensible thing to do in many cases, but for the purposes here it should be fine. Okay, one of the first things I always do is, is do the exploratory data analysis and do some basic plotting. And here's just a scatter plot with some just color, color overlaid for our different groups. And so for both uh, distillus and uh, for, for our genotype DLL and WT and our temperature 25 and 30 we've just got coded by red and blue and circles and triangles to take a look and you know it's very hard to see any sort of pattern from this one of the things we can do is fit some non-parametric curves over it, non-parametric splines here we're just going to use uh, low S, so locally weighted regressions uh, and fit it. Uh, we've gone over this code previously in exploratory data analysis so I won't review it too much here, but uh, please do pause this and take a look at the code if, if necessary. Um, what's more important is just to take a look at it, and generally what we see is a pattern where it looks like um, there's essentially no relationship between six compete and tarsus length for both the wild type, uh, wild type at 25 and reared at 25 or 30, and similarly for the, uh, perhaps for the uh, mutant reared at 30, although it's a little harder to tell, uh, at 25, there's definitely, for the mutant, there's definitely some upward swing. But again, this is hardly super informative. So uh, right off the bat, you know, we know that this may not be the relationship between sex comb teeth and tarsus isn't going to account for a lot of variation, but there may be something interesting there, and it's, it's worth understanding. Um, 
And we won't do it here. I'll leave this for you. You can again pause this here if you want to take a look at it. These are just block, box plots and, and some lattice plots to look at the data in different ways. These again, this again is just some exploratory data analysis following along with what we did in the exploratory data analysis screencast. Let's actually jump right ahead. We're on line 71 to fitting some basic linear models and think about what we do in R to fit those models. So uh, I apologize for the poor naming. This is against my naming convention, so bad Ian, please don't do this. Um, but we're just going to call the, the model regression.1, um, which is poor in, in, as a name anyways. Um, what's more important is we're, we're outputting everything into this regression.1. So unlike SAS, which outputs everything to the screen, um, in R, you, when you call in your model, you want to put it into an object, and that object is storing a lot of complex things that you can grab as needed, and, and we'll see that we do that. So the first thing we do is we're going to use the LM function. LM is for linear model. Uh, this is for any case where we're fitting a basic ANOVA or regression or analysis of covariance kind of model. Um, of course, the assumptions are that the residuals are normally distributed, um, that uh, you know, this has a mean as what we call link fu uh, uh, identity function would be the link function. We'll, we'll come back to that later when we talk about generalized linear models. But essentially that this is any sort of standard regression ANOVA kind of framework. Um, and so we just say sex comb teeth here. And again, tilde is sort of saying is modeled as. So sex comb teeth is modeled as a function of tarsus with data equals DLL data. You will notice, and we'll come back to this in a moment, that there is no explicit uh, intercept here, you can put one there, you can go one plus tarsus, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So we we do that, and we fit it, and you'll notice that if we go to our output window, there's no output that comes with it. We call it, but nothing comes out. That's because it's all being stored in this regression dot one object. So we have to ask for things. I'm actually going to clear the screen though. Um, before we actually start asking for any of the output, let me just reshape these screens to make it a little easier. My apologies. I want to remind you that we should think about the design matrix that we're using, and we can look at the design matrix explicitly. In this case, it should be quite simple using the model.matrix function. Uh, if we call model.matrix uh, for the whole regression, we remember there's 1,917 or 18 observations. It's a lot of data. Um, we don't want to pour that all onto the screen, so instead we can start just by using head to look at the six first observation that in this matrix, and of course our intercept. Uh, that that column's all going to have one, and for tarsus, the in this design matrix, that will have the actual values of tarsus that were observed here, because this is a continuous covariate. Uh, there's no dummy variables in this particular model. We can also, because the model matrix is just a, a regular numeric matrix, we can index it like we would any other matrix in R. So here we're looking at the 500th, the 520th. Um, uh, um, rows in, in that design matrix and, and sort of looking at what we see. Okay, so that's just to remind you that we can look at that and that will become much more important when we think about analysis of variance uh, uh, or more complicated models in general. Okay, so oh, I, I mentioned and I actually just realized it's not here that we don't have a uh, this this formulation here regression dot one did not have an explicit um, intercept written down. But we can actually very easily, let's call it regression dot one dot intercept, <laughs> also poorly named, and we can actually, sorry, I'm typing very quickly, we can actually get one plus tarsus, And as we'll see in a moment, that this is going to actually give us identical output. So the point here is that when you don't include it, the intercept is implicit. That's very important to remember, that there's an implicit intercept. If we want to exclude it, there are definitely ways of doing that. And essentially what we can do is turn this one into either a zero or a negative one. And we will see certain cases where we do that. Okay. And what's the name of the... I'm just going to copy this down here so we can double check. All right, so let's actually take a look at what we some of the output. And probably the the best place to look. Um, most people start with the summary, but we'll come to that in a second. Is the actual estimated coefficients from the regression, so the parameters that we've estimated. 
And if we do that, we do this, and again, we're going to get a slope and an intercept. And we have an intercept of 6 and a tarsus uh, uh, slope associated with the, the, the predictor variable of tarsus of almost 27. All right, well, it's a little hard to interpret what does that mean. What does an intercept of 6 mean? Well, that means when tarsus length is 0, um, we, the expected number of sex comb teeth on a leg should be 6. So we'll come back to that later, because clearly that's kind of a ridiculous idea. What do you mean having a tarsus length of zero? That's nonsensical. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Or actually, I gather in that next screencast the way I've set it up. Um, I also want to make the point that when we explicitly put the intercept in the model, again, this is the 1 plus SCT, uh, it gives identical results, because the intercept is implicit. Okay. Uh, another thing we can do, sorry, I realized, let's fix that. Uh, we can also look at confidence intervals. So here are confidence intervals, and it defaults for 95% confidence intervals for our slope and our intercept. And our uh, confidence intervals for our intercept are between 5 and, and 7, essentially, and, and for the tarsus, between 23 and, and 31, essentially. So again, it's a little hard to interpret the intercept right now. The slope uh, will come back to thinking what that really means. One thing you might immediately realize is, well, that slope does not overlap with zero. So for people who care a great deal about significance, yeah, this is clearly significantly different from zero, and apparently quite far from zero. Um, we still can't necessarily just interpret it right off the bat. I want to make a point about both confint and this next function we're going to look at, the summary function. We've used summary a lot. Summary and confint are both, when you just call them like this, are generic methods in R, or generic functions. They call class-specific methods. What that means is regression.1 is of class LM. It's a linear model object. So when you call confint for that linear model object, what it is actually doing, or summary, what it's actually doing is calling confint.lm for regression.1 or summary.lm for regression.1. And so what I would like you to do as an exercise, maybe pause for a second uh, and try this. Go summary.lm regression.1 and compare it to summary regression of one. They should be the same output. That's an important thing to, con uh, to look at. It also means that when you're trying to understand this, the outputs of some of these, uh, of these methods like confint or summary, you actually want to go question mark summary.lm, not just question mark summary, because you'll get a, oh, it's a, a generic method or something, some, something that won't be helpful. But if you go question mark summary.lm, it may actually give you a lot more information about what's in that summary object. Uh, Okay, sorry, that was a bit of our specific uh, verbiage, but hopefully that was, that was useful. Okay, so let's take a look now in the last few minutes of this screencast at the summary. Uh, and it's going to give us a whole lot of things. Um, I'll, I'll put it here, and we can put them all on our screen at once, hopefully. All right, so we call summary.regression. The first thing that we get out of it is this call. Call, it basically just reiterates the model that we fit. Here's the linear model. Okay, that's useful just to remind ourselves of the actual model we fit. It also gives us a sort of a brief thing about the residuals, essentially quantiles of the residuals, the minimum, the maximum, first and, and third quantile, and the median. Why are these useful? Well, we'll come back to this after, but just remember that we expect that the, the residuals should have a mean of zero, um, yeah, so the median should be very close, and that they should be more or less symmetric. If they're normally distributed, they should be more or less symmetric. So what we're essentially using these for is to say, do these look like they're sort of of similar values? And you can see right here that the min and max are quite different. Um, the, the maximum is essentially, in terms of absolute magnitude, about three to almost, not quite three, but two and a half times as large. Uh, so maybe there's something that we all have to peer into the residuals afterwards to, to make sense of this. We get our coefficients from this as well, and we have our estimated uh, intercept, our estimated slope, just like we saw before. But when we do summary, we also get the standard errors for each of these values, and the t-values, and again, the t-value, should just remind yourself, is just going to be the estimate divided by the standard error in each case, uh, which is sort of a good way of getting sort of the uncertainty associated with it. Um, and then uh, for those t-tests for the regression coefficients, just p-values associated with them, which we don't care so much about. We get a couple other useful things from this. We obviously get the multiple and adjusted r-squares, which we'll talk about in lecture. Um, and what this is basically telling us is we can account for, of all of the observed variation for sex comb teeth that, that we see in this data set, this model 
can account for about 8, 8.5% of the variation, which is not very large, but it's also not tiny. It's, just, it's, just a, it's a reasonable amount, especially in biology. You know, a, a single variable accounting for anything greater than 5% of the variation by itself is, is not too bad, and this is a very simple model. Um, so what we can take a look at what that means afterwards. Um, we also get an F statistic um, with uh, the number of degrees of freedom, uh, 1 in 1960. So we have 1 because uh, we're only estimating just the tarsus, 1 slope, 1960, uh, 1916 residual degrees of freedom. So that's our F statistic uh, and p-values associated. And this is an overall model. So this doesn't tell us about individual um, coefficients, but about the overall fit of the model relative to accounting for no variation as, as a default. Um, so w one way of thinking about that is that uh, one way of, of sort of putting all that together is sort of thinking about the residual standard error. So we have a residual standard error of here of about 1.55. Well, what does that residual standard error do? Um, it, it sort of tells you that it gives you some idea of almost a, a, a in a coarse way of prediction error. It tells you that you can predict the number of sex comb teeth on any individual given up, up to an, an accuracy of about 1.5 sex comb teeth, given this model. Uh, it, this will, of course, change as, as we model this, and I would suggest looking at page 41 of Gelman and Hill to take a look at that. All right, we're going to pause the screencast here, and we'll continue on in the next part, uh, looking at the variance-covariance matrix of this model and, and interpreting the coefficients more deeply.